I'm Marty Stauffer. When a European explorers first came to this continent, they were amazed by the small, iridescent birds that they found here. They'd never seen anything like these multicolored creatures back home in their native continent. And they watched, astounded, as these tiny birds buzzed whimsically through the air, zipping up and down, frontwards and backwards, their wings blurred with speed. Today, we know them as hummingbirds. Of course, their name comes from the humming of their wings in flight. The European explorers had not seen them before because they live only in the New World, in North and South America. But the most unusual feature of this group of birds is their size. The body of an adult ruby-throated hummingbird is no larger than one joint of my smallest finger and their nests are miniature sculptures made out of leaves, grass, plant down, sometimes spider webs. This one's decorated with bits of lichen for camouflage. It's hard to imagine that there are living birds inside these tiny eggs. But within several weeks, they'll hatch. And then after being cared for by the mother bird for several more weeks, they'll fly away. In some ways, they seem modern, like little living helicopters. And in some ways, they seem like ancient royalty of the animal kingdom. Come along with me and explore the tiny but incredibly beautiful world of feathered jewels. These tiny creatures comprise the second largest family of birds in the New World, with over 300 species. Of these, only 15 regularly breed and nest within the borders of the United States. Ironically, their vocal talents do not match their dazzling appearance. Most do not sing. They don't walk either. These birds live in the air. This Anna's Hummingbird was filmed at normal speed, 24 frames per second. Its wings beat 80 times each second. At a camera speed of 1,500 frames per second, the action of its rotating wing and darting tongue are more easily observed.
The bird's tongue is tubular and forked and fringed at the tip for gathering nectar from deep inside the blossom. Filmed even slower, at 2,400 frames per second, one one-hundredth real time, a hummingbird is a marvel of nature's engineering. Most people know only one species, the ruby-throated hummingbird. It has the largest range and is the only one to breed east of the Mississippi. The male is the namesake, with his black throat that flashes red in the sun. Comparatively drab in color, the female has a white throat. In the west, the most common is the black-chinned hummingbird, which breeds all the way to the Pacific coast. A familiar mountain species and the most northerly breeder is the rufous, The female black chin resembles the female ruby throat in her drabness. The male displays a throat of black or purple according to the light. Champion migrants of the family, the Rufus make a round trip of 4,000 miles each year from their breeding grounds in Alaska to their wintering range in Mexico. The female Rufus fits perfectly to her chosen flower, a California fuchsia. When the angle of bird, sun, and viewer are in harmony, the male's orange throat gleams golden. But it's the color of his back that gives this species its name. It's rufous, or coppery red. The Rockies and the Great Basin Mountains are the breeding range for the broad-tailed hummingbird. While the Calliope summers in mountain meadows in the United States and in Canada. The male broadtail wears a rosy collar like the ruby throat. Both sexes are metallic green on their backs and sides. The female is the common nester in the Rockies. The Calliope, here feeding on paintbrush flowers, is the smallest hummingbird and the smallest bird in the United States, two to three inches in length and one-tenth of an ounce in weight. But like the others in her family, she requires enormous amounts of energy. This footage is rare because these busy birds seldom rest. The only hummingbird to live year-round in America is the Annas, which ranges west of the Sierras. The Costas hummingbird breeds in the deserts to the south and in Mexico. The Annas usually breeds within the borders of a single state, California. There, the female is the earliest of all birds to nest. The male has a distinctive red throat. As if to reconfirm their elevated status in the animal kingdom, the Annas 
like the Costas, was named after 19th century royalty. The male Costas even wears a royal color, displayed in the purple streamers on his neck and his purple throat and crown. With the breeding range that barely reaches above the Mexican border are four rare visitors to this country, the Lucifer, the Rivalis, the Broad-Billed, and the Blue-Throated Hummingbirds. The Chisos Mountains in Texas are not as barren as they appear. In spring, the flowers bloom and attract their constant companions, the hummingbirds. A female Lucifer feeds on pent steaming flowers. Feeding on an Ocotillo, a beautiful male Rivalis. And on the same flower, the male Broadbill, with his emerald green underparts and wide red bill with a black tip. The female of the species lacks his brightly colored bill. Their broad bills are the appropriate shape and size for dipping into particular flowers. These isolated desert mountains are breeding grounds for the blue throat our largest hummingbird, about four to five inches in length. Breeding just north of the Mexican border are the elusive white-eared and violet-crowned hummingbirds. The white ear is named for the white feather stripe over each ear. The violet crowned hummingbirds gleaming white underparts make it unique. Rarest of all North American hummingbirds, the buff-bellied breeds only in the lower Rio Grande Valley. Essentially, it's a Mexican species that has moved north. Another rare aspect of this bird is the similarity of male and female. Broadtail's clutch of two could fit many times over into one hen's egg. This bird of the coniferous forest uses nearby lichen as camouflage. The nest of a hummingbird is among nature's most delicate structures. The broad tail builds hers from plant down and binds it together with spider's web. When building a nest, it's helpful to have a spider nearby. But good webs don't always make good neighbors. Hummingbirds have been found entangled in those of larger spiders. Even so, the birds sometimes eat smaller spiders for food or rob their webs of insects. 
The black-chinned hummingbird also wraps her inch-wide nest with spider's web. This broadbill's hanging nest is another variation. Like all the females in her family, the Annas prepares a nest and raises her young alone. The male has long since vanished, his family duties completed with the fertilization of her eggs. The clutch is almost always two. The twins incubate in their eggs longer, yet are much less developed upon hatching than other songbirds. Every day, the mother must collect at least her own weight in food. She then sinks her bill deep into their crops and regurgitates a mixture of insects and nectar. The proportionately large crop or storage pouch inside their neck helps the hummingbird young store food for hours at a time. In adults, it holds enough food for overnight. Chiricahua Mountains of Southern Arizona. Hummingbirds can survive only where flowers are abundant and available. Amazingly, the desert provides. So agile is the Rivoli's, or magnificent hummingbird, at a claret cup flower that it completely avoids the painful sting of cactus spines. Hummingbird flowers have evolved for form and color. Red, the birds have learned, can be associated with a reliable source of nectar. In the west, where birds follow the blooming up the mountainsides, Red is the predominant flower color. But brilliant color is not the main purpose of these flowers. Neither is scent. The blossoms cannot waste perfume to attract bees or insects that take nectar without paying for it by cross-pollinating. Form follows function in hummingbird flowers. Most, like these coral bean blossoms, possess long tubular corollas that lead to the nectar. As the bird feeds, it picks up pollen on its bill and its feathers. Moving on, it deposits pollen from the male anthers of the first flower onto the female stigma of the next, and so on through the flower patch.
A thistle's shape seems the exception to the rules about hummingbird flowers. And the fact that the little birds have been found fatally trapped in the large prickly flower heads makes them a dangerous choice for nourishment. Flowers without long corollas, like lilies, have extra long reproductive parts. This way the pollen is certain to be picked up and passed on to the next lily. Sap suckers also supply food for the ever hungry hummingbirds. The sap wells they drill in tree bark. I've seen a hummingbird visiting and drinking from a certain sap well more times in one day than the sap sucker which drilled it. Their carbohydrates come from flower nectar and the sugary tree sap. Insects trapped in the sticky sap are also eaten they supply the protein that completes the hummingbird's diet. Humans also supply nourishment. In one Arizona location, 50 pint bottles were filled twice a day to serve an estimated 5,000 hummingbirds. Among them, some hungry songbirds, the acorn woodpecker, and the Scots Oriole. A blue-throated hummingbird also fed daily. Perhaps these wild creatures accept our presence easily because they've suffered little from man. Except for a brief period in the 19th century when the tiny birds were fashionable adornments on ladies' hats, humans and hummingbirds have lived harmoniously. Elusive and small, hummingbirds can nest just as they eat, almost anywhere. Constantly moving, the birds take in at least half their weight in food daily. A human expending the same amount of energy would require 150,000 calories a day. Ancient, far-ranging, and successful, hummingbirds have survived because they created their own niche. The only real threat to their future is the rapid destruction of tropical forests where they winter. If we protect their winter range in South America and provide for their summer needs here in North America, these living treasures will continue to bring us beauty, delight, and fascination.
If you're interested in attracting hummingbirds to your own backyard, it's easy. All you have to do is put up a feeder with a sugar solution in it. It's like the nectar in the flowers. Now there are some mixes available, but they have colors and dyes in them, things the birds don't really need. But more importantly, you can easily make your own. Mix about four parts of water to one part sugar. I like to use hot tap water because the sugar will dissolve faster. Now don't use honey. It's been known to cause tumors on their bills and even death. Now this seems weird to me because bees make honey from flower nectar, but that's the way it is. Also, you don't need to color the water because a red feeder will attract the birds. And in fact, you don't even need a feeder. I've had good success making my own. All you need is a small open jar like this. Put a little red paint or nail polish around the top of it, and that attracts the birds, gets their attention. They'll hover and uh, stick their beak in or even land right on the jar. You should remember, though, to take your feeders down by about Labor Day. That way you won't delay the annual southward migration of these beautiful little feathered jewels. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.